All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm joined by Jason Troy, who is in Dallas, Texas. How are you doing, Jason? I'm doing wonderful. You are in a beautiful place. I've got a couple of clients in San Diego. So it's. Yeah, we, well, I am, but we have actually had winter storms over the last few days. We had gale force wow. winds, lashing rain. We had everything that was very, very, very un San Diego like. Oh, wow. I guess it's January. Crazy weather yeah. everywhere at some point. So. Yeah. So Jason helps companies, executives, managers, uh, and HR departments develop high-performing and engage leaders and talent and teamwork. And what we're going to talk about is sales management and how to how to create and manage a high-performing sales team. So um, Jason, let's get straight into it. Let's let's baseline it. Uh, sales manager at sales management today. What what makes for a good sales manager in today's world? Well, I mean, obviously you've got to set the vision, right? I think you also have to have great relationships across the organization with other people, your executives, and I think also be able to get the most out of your team and really understand what levers and dials to push with them and also for them to work with each other. And so I think when you can put all these things together, you can work at a pretty high level um, and get what you need to be done. Now, obviously, their skill sets, right? Working externally with clients and other people that are on top of all of these things that I'm assuming that someone in that role would have, but um, that's also obviously very important. Yeah, um, but w- one of the challenges, right, is that uh, everything you outlined is correct. The, one of the challenges, though, is that a lot of sales managers are promoted salespeople. And unfortunately, yeah. in a lot of organizations, they never get the training or the support to to, to be successful. Um, so that that is one of the biggest challenges you often face is you have a high performing salesperson, they're made a sales manager, and then suddenly they struggle because they were never given the support or the training or the guidance to succeed in, in the new role. Yeah, and I think it's really difficult, right, as an individual contributor or being a salesperson and then being a manager and being in charge of other people and having to report into a different structure and work across the business in a new way, it's really difficult for someone. And these are all learned behaviors and skill sets that you have to learn. So without training and without the time to figure it out and also to build, you know, the teamwork within your team, these are all really difficult things. And a lot of people fail because they don't spend enough time on, you know, these power and soft skills now that are more required in the job, even more than they were before. And, and you're right, if no, a lot of people don't get training, right? And I mean, they just promote someone because they think, well, if you're doing great in sales, you should be a leader yeah. or a manager. And that really is independent of your ability to perform. Because there's a lot of people that are managers and leaders in sales that are good, but they weren't like in the top 1%. So I don't think, and that's a whole, it's a whole discussion in itself. Yeah, no, it is. It is. Cause it's a great analogy there with sports. I mean, some of the, I mean, you look at professional soccer, you know, some of the top um, managers yeah. in the world were average players at best. Yeah. And I think that's, that's a huge piece of it. So I think when you thrust people's in roles and you don't prepare them, it usually though is a chain reaction up in a lot of ways where in the organization itself when they're not training people or right? not, it's not solely that, but I often find in the leaders of the sales organization have significant blind spots and gaps and they're not, you know, devoted and committed to curiosity and learning and development and under fully understand their roles either. So I think it's usually a chain reaction from the top down that causes a lot of these problems. And it's not the individuals themselves or the sales methodologies or a lot of this stuff. A lot of this is people problems, management problems, leadership problems, teamwork problems that need to be solved and that are just never, never done because the people above them don't know what to do and they don't have the proper training. Mm-hmm. So where do you advise uh, a sales manager to start uh, when, when trying to get the team up a level? Where, where is the first place you would advise them to focus? I mean, on themselves. Because, I mean, you have to, as self-awareness is the first place to start. Because you have to know your blind spots. You have to know what you're good at. 
Because otherwise, what ends up happening is that starts to play itself out and you're completely unaware of what's going on around you. And I mean, you know, all change and everything in our life happens by looking inward and asking ourselves hard questions and looking in the mirror. It's not external, right? Because that's a Band-Aid. And if you haven't done that work, I find it's really difficult to help someone because then these other things start to come out like in everything that you do. And they're the things that hold us back the most as individuals, as leaders, managers, and even in our own personal lives. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you raised that. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a bit of a soapbox of mine as well, but I think self-awareness is the greatest inhibitor to success for people in any, in any, uh, in any avenue of life. Well, the data uh, in shows any, this. In any world. I mean, okay. Tasha Yurik, who's, who wrote a book called Insight, and she's probably one of the top leading researchers, have showed, and I've seen other things that, you know, somewhere between 90, 95% of, of people think they're self-aware, and we're only, only 10 to 15% are. So it's that gap. And the higher you go, the more the self-awareness gap exists that goes on because you have no one to check you and you don't really do the job. And 360 reviews in a vacuum don't normally work very well for a whole host of reasons. So you really have to be dedicated to this and you have to look at it as part of your job in order to be successful. And I rarely see people be successful over the long term if they don't look into this, or usually they do when they had some precipitously bad thing happen to them and they've had a string of great things go on, right? And they don't know what it is and they can't figure it out. And that's when they go for help. So I told people, why, do you, why are you waiting to fall off the cliff? Because it's mm -hmm. not a matter of, of when or if, it's when, right? And I think you have to assume that this is going to happen because I've never seen anyone where this has not happened. And, and it'd be really difficult to find that person that hasn't worked on this, that magically just continues to get better through like some intervention on their own and can see these things. Yeah, no, I think that's a fantastic point, uh, Jason, is that, uh, yeah, you shouldn't be waiting around and, uh, for the time when the crisis happens because we rarely do, it rarely do you get a lot of clarity in that situation. Where do you, do you get long-term, you know, fixes, uh, you get crisis management and then you move on. So, I mean, I think that the point is absolutely is that you should be working on that. So self-awareness is number one, working on yourself. What would be the second place to focus? I think it's managing your own team, right? Because I mean, you have to get the most out of the people around you. And I think teamwork is the most overlooked strategic priority out there. And you have to also have those people work across the organization as well, right? And how do they help each other, solve each other's problems and do it as a group? Because if you look at the data, right? They put all-star teams together, right? In sports, in nursing, doctors, pilots, and they've looked at the data and they don't do near as well as people who get along really well and have experience working with each other. So it's not about you hiring the greatest talent. It's you getting the most out of the talent around you and each, and each person helping to lift up the person around it. That is the difference. And so I think understanding how to do that is absolutely critical, both as an entire team and how you're managing each individual in this process. And if you don't, you will fail or you'll get significantly less out of those people and you'll continually try to beat them to get more. And that isn't the way. It's the teamwork that is, you know, they say the teamwork makes the dream work and that's extremely trite, but it's absolutely true so I think you need to learn really how to motivate them, how to work with each other in a team. And then also you have got to learn human behavior and psychology and how to bring out the strengths in each individual you speak to. And one way people make mistakes is every week you should have a one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, and it should be focused on helping people with what's going on, but it also should be the development things they need to work on that are career, other things other than asking them, like, what's your pipeline looks like? And the boring questions, because that is like repetitive information. That's not advancing anyone. And people on your team, all the time, people complain to me. The number one thing is lack of feedback and lack of career development from the CEO down to low level people in an organization. Those are the two biggest complaints I get all the time. So, right? So, and you got to know that if you have one-on-ones every week, it's shown to increase productivity by 50% than if you do them bi-weekly or monthly. So, I mean, 
there's a lot of this data that someone needs to figure it out and structure and put in place. And you're much more highly efficient and effective as a team, just like you are in anything you do. Yeah. Yeah, let me unpack a couple of things there that you said, because you've there's so much in what you just said, there's so, so much uh, truth and, and so much insight. Um, the, the first thing is, uh, from a management point of view, you know, you mentioned um, the one on ones really understanding your people. I, I mean, I used to have this thing where people, you know, when you ask somebody, oh, um, you know, what kind of where's your career path? What do you want to do? You know, where do you see yourself? All that kind of stuff. And, you know, more often than not, people would say, oh, I, you know, I want to move up and be a manager. And I would ask them, why do you want to be a manager? And, and they would say, well, because I think I'm good at leading. And I would say, OK, well, here's the reality of management. OK, I said, you're a part time psych psychiatrist, psychologist, parent. Uh, you also are a punching bag. Uh, and uh, and it's so if, if you're happy with all and you think, yeah, I can take all of those things, good, go for it. Uh, but I think to your point, though, is you have to understand that understanding people and the psychology of people and stuff is so critically important that that is something if you're going to have a high performing team, you can't overlook that piece. No, and, and I think then you have to figure out how do you build trust amongst people and what are the levers to push and pull, right? How do you show people that you care, right? How are you going to train and develop your team independent of what the company does? I mean, how, are you building relationships? Like a lot of the time, you know, the sales manager, one of the biggest relationships people miss is the operations side or the marketing side, right? Your job yeah. is to meet with those people and build those relationships to help your team and to show them that if they don't communicate across the organization, they will not be successful because those people will, will block you when they're trying to get stuff done or when a client or a customer has a problem and you need help fixing it. These are the people that are going to be there or take a call at 10 o'clock at night and fix it or ignore you and wait till the next day, right? So like, yeah. there's a lot that you need to do and sit down and figure it out. It's extremely complex. <clears throat> there's a lot of people don't do well on it because of it. <clears throat> I think the, the other thing that you mentioned there, and you just came back to it there again, is, and, and I think this is the fault of, we've done it to ourselves in many ways, but we promoted this idea of the, uh, the salesperson being a kind of independent, solo, you know, out there yeah. on the, on the yeah. edge, doing it all. And, and somehow they're a different breed from everybody else in the organization and should be treated differently. And you should understand the fact that you know, they're all individuals and, you know, it's an art, it's not a science and, and all of this kind of stuff and process. Well, that's for other people. Uh, and that is such a bad mistake because just what you have outlined there is number one, you need to have the sales team working together within that sales team. And you need to, they need to develop other relationships internal to the organization and have people feel like, we're all on the same team. So if you're too much, if you've got too much rugged individualism going on, it's self-defeating. I mean, one of the things I always do when I'm going in at a sales leadership is I ask the, the head of sales, how good is your relationship with operations if they're tied hand in hand or if marketing is really their partner or if it's engine, whatever it is. And almost always I'll get, well, you know, we have a good relationship. And I said, is it great? And I'm like, no. And I said, unless you have a great relationship, that's going to affect your entire team. And you need to be in lockstep with that person so they can help you and you help them. And then I have them go out to lunch or go out to happy hour and spend a lot of time. And I give them questions to ask, to get to know each other and literally become best friends. And then what you see is like a transformational experience where you'll see all the metrics magically getting better in the next successive quarters, regardless of what they do because everything is more together and it's less combative, there's less defensiveness, right? And there's more working as one team, right? As a starting point. And in, even if you're not at that level and you're a sales manager, you need to have those same relationships across the board and practice those things and understand how they can help you. And you're not isolated and people around you are not your enemy or they're not someone that you need to like, you know, gr you know scringe and like, you know, roll your eyes at, at that point, they're people to help you, right? And they're just as important as the people externally that you need to get or prospects and customers, right? So yeah. it's a missed opportunity. And I think no, it, a lot it, of issues. It, it is absolutely. And I, and I can just give you a, a, an example of uh, um, some years back with, with another company and we were doing some consulting work with a, a, a company that's a global brand, we well known. And we found that the issue, you know, that there were some issues between sales and marketing. So we persuaded the CEO 
to host a meeting with myself and and Neil Rackham, who the 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 the, uh, the writer of Spin Selling and all that. Uh, and we got the the sales leadership and the marketing leadership in the same room with the CEO and they're sitting on other side opposite sides of the table There's about five in each group so there's probably 10 12 people in the room and literally the first part of that meeting was finger pointing just across the road each of them you know the marketing pointing and sales sales pointed back at market and it was just one big argument and it was very clear then to the CEO oh I see where we might have an issue <laughs> And this happens almost in every organization is the same, right? At some level that's going on and someone doesn't know. And it's because the relationship isn't strong enough in the communication and the conflict resolution and the compromising isn't there. And you have to start off from a point of really getting to know these people before all this stuff will work. And I find that that's one of the biggest challenges that goes on in organizations today, right? I mean, mm. we get all in the management and leadership skills that are required but at the end of the day, your job as a manager to help scale your team, then just keep scaling the organization. And that is the most difficult thing to do because you have to get more efficient. And at some point, you have to leave the work and empower other people and be the psychologist, be the sociologist, right? Be the mm -hmm. high level person and you have to get away from the work. And that these are skills you have to paint and change over time and understand how to do that as you're in the job. Because otherwise what will happen is you'll be doing the work of a lower level person and you'll become very inefficient at the things that you need to do and you'll never progress in your career. Yeah. And I think uh, it's a great, the greatest gift you can give to your competitors is internal conflict and competition, because there's nothing greater for your co competitors to think, great, well, if they're arguing among themselves in there and they're doing, we'll, we'll just go grab customers in the meantime. Um, so what is it, what is another area where you would advise a sales manager to focus to make sure the team works? So we've got like, you know, focus on yourself, get, get your teamwork going, build relationships outside your department. I think the other part of it is you have to get a certain amount of mastery over some soft skills, right? Like empathy, problem solving, how do you communicate with other people? How do you resolve conflicts, right? How do you actually build a relationship with someone? Like what's a relationship one-on-one? How do I go in and build trust with someone quickly? And do you have a plan and a strategy to do that, right? I think a lot of these skills are way underdeveloped by people. And then what happens is they encounter them and they're not very good at them and they cause a lot of roadblocks. I mean, one of them also is just listening, seek to understand. Mm -hmm. I mean, people say that all the time and I see how few people listen because they're, instead of asking questions, I always told people you have two ears and one mouth, use it in that ratio and you'll see dramatic things change, but you have to have training and development and helping people on your team to practice that and get people to, to do things differently. And so I think the soft skills, power skills development is absolutely critical to do. And it's an ongoing thing where you have to pick things because hard skill, you read it, you do it, you get better. With this, the soft skill, you read it or get trained on it, experience it, and then have to pivot and get information back and then have to get better at it. It's really a difficult thing to do. And you need to start early on with people overall. And I think without that, you're going to be really difficult to train your team to be really good. And they're not going to hear their clients. They're not really going to understand them and do a really good job of being a servant leader to them, which means helping them solve their problems. Even if it's not your problem with them, how can you be a partner to them where they can't let you go because they look at you as their best friend, as a support network, as someone who's going to help them solve problems in their own business beyond the solution or service you're selling, right? Like, all of that people can say, but if you don't have the soft skills behind it, you can't really do it. You're not really going to feel it. And the other person won't believe that that's the person that you're at. Of course, you can have a couple people in your team doing it, but the whole point is getting every single person to do that. That's when you will rock and that's when you'll raise right to the top past all of the people in your organization. Yeah, and, and I love that point as well. I do, I, I do think we have done ourselves a serious disservice by calling these skills soft skills because they're so easily I dismissed. Yeah, uh, you know, it's very oh soft skills. Yeah, don't need them. Or or that's a nice to have. Yeah, maybe next year we'll we'll look at that. But to your point, um, if you don't have if you don't have good if you can't 
be authentic, if you don't know how to be empathetic, if you don't have good listening skills. And, and as you said, listening skills, people talk about them all the time. But the best example of true listening skills I've ever seen is what they is what they use often in group and family therapy and all of those things or in couples therapy, that idea of when one person says something, um, the other person has to repeat back what they said, but not just one, they have to continue to repeat back what they said until the person who said it agrees that that's exactly what they meant. That's a whole other level of listening. Skills. And I think that's what people need to do more of is saying, am I listening and am I listening so intently that I'm really getting the understanding of what the person is saying? Or am I kind of half listening and thinking of my clever reply? And that's what happens most of the time people listening, right? I mean, I ask everyone there to ask themselves, how many times is someone talking and you think about your reply or your rebuttal or whatever it is you're thinking? How much do you actually listen to someone without having anything go on your head and just focus on that? Of the times that you're interacting with someone in a day, I think you'd be finding it extremely small. And that means you're missing a lot in what people are saying. And the problem Mm -hmm. with that is every time you interact with a prospect or a client, There are ways to drive the conversation deeper and across the organization and be more help if that's how you're positioning yourself in your head and you're focused more on the moment than you are on getting a reply or a buttle or trying to think about, oh, this is some clever line I'm saying, now I'm going to sell in two seconds and I'm going to get into my sales mode, Mm -hmm. right? Like that's Mm -hmm. what people do and they lose that really valuable opportunity and you have to train yourself to do this and people need help because otherwise they won't, right? They won't be an active listener. They've got to be focused. That's why in meetings, you should have people put down their cell phones, put down their computers, right? Like focus on it, ask them to recap or ask people to go around and give strategic advice. And then the other way people do that wrong in a meeting is that you start with the most junior person because if you don't, then it'll bias the rest of their responses. So that's yet another yeah. art for a manager is to understand the group dynamics and how do I get the most out of every person and get them to speak up and share their ideas, whether they're right, wrong, or indifferent. Yeah, no, I think that's, I'm I'm so glad you raised raised that. I think that's such a critical part is that you have to get engagement from your team and you have to understand that sometimes that's not going to come naturally and there are going to be people who are more verbose than other people who are happy to hog the limelight and people who are happy to sort of keep things to themselves you've got to you've got to create some balance within within that group dynamic and make sure that you're getting the best the best out of everybody and by the way there's another thing there a great skill that, that teaches if, if you ask me a, if you if you if I ask you a question and you're giving me an answer right now at the end of your answer I can say to you um, Jason oh that's really interesting Can you, can you just give me a moment let me just let me just process that and then I'll and then reply so because because it's often with salespeople it particularly is they feel the need to reply immediately no yes. pauses no gaps no silence or instead of having a clever response, you can say to someone if you're not clear, so tell me more about that. Mm-hmm. Explain to me more like what you're thinking, right? Give me, a, give me a scenario and an example of how you'd see this playing out. And that allows you to understand something more deeply with someone else, right? So I think a lot of this is when we seek to understand and that is our priority, we ask better questions And then we can actually engage with that person in a much deeper and more meaningful and beneficial level other than trying to get out there and get on our soapbox or immediately solve it. We may not have all the data and information from it. So like I always tell people that like that's another huge skill set, not jumping to conclusions and thinking you have the answer, right? And that's another problem with sales managers that they'll talk at people instead of going around where there's a problem, they should ask people in the group, so who can tell me how they might solve this? You don't have to be right, but we're gonna go and have you all take a shot at this. Because if I tell you how to do this, then I'm, te- I'm, I'm telling you how to fish. I'm not teaching you to fish yourself, right? Well, that takes a little bit of time and a meaning, but it's extremely beneficial because it gets people to think on their own and it's okay to fail because success and failure are opposite sides of the same coin. You got to get people to problem solve, to think, to process, and to learn. And you have to do that as a manager and take the time in order to really allow people to speak, share, work together as a group, problem solve, 
and then you can intervene and help them to walk them through the solution. Just don't hand it to them or tell them, oh, you're stupid or, oh, you should have figured that out or why didn't you do this, right? Like, mm -hmm. that's not helpful. That's because you're missing an opportunity with the entire team. And then you create a situation where there's lack of psychological safety. And when you do that in a group and you create fear, people will not come forward and share critical information with you. And that will hurt you. Because I always say like, whatever information's in someone's mind that they don't share is really going to hurt you. Your job as a manager is to get people to push you information, not that you have to pull because there's no way you can do that with a team and especially if you want to scale and grow to other positions in the organization. Yeah. And, and let's be honest, uh, at the end of the day, when you do engage people like that in problem solving, the, you, may, you may have an answer already, but quite likely the answer that will come up by the, the group getting involved is likely to be better than the one that you had yourself alone. Yeah. And you'll learn, right? And you'll learn yeah. from them. And you, what you need to do is get them to work with each other to solve the problem instead of you having to be the gatekeeper all the time, yeah. right? You having to lean on them, right? You should also be giving them the role of working across the organization and building relationships with their peers in marketing, operations, engineering, wherever it is. So they start to understand how to interact with these people and build these strong relationships, right? And like one of the best way to do that is building trust is just to ask people questions, right? Ask yeah. people questions that are deep and meaningful, right? Like tell, tell me what's the biggest lesson you've learned during this pandemic, right? Like growing up, I'm just curious, like who played the best, who played the influence in your life that you thank right now for helping you? Like who was that right. person, right? And asking them deep questions is how we build deep relationships because we know all this information because we think about the people that are closest to our personal life. We know a lot of vulnerable information. So you need to do that with your peers, with your team. And also the same thing can apply to a prospect and a customer. It's how quickly can you build trust with them and get to know them and vice versa, have them trust you. So it's, a, but it's about asking questions and getting to know people outside of selling them something or some business aspect of it. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm um, absolutely, Jason. And listen, thank you so much for for talking to us today. You have packed so much into this, and so many like profound insights for people. I, I really appreciate that. All of Jason's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please take a moment to tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. So I work with organizations, with managers and teams to help them on leadership management, teamwork, problem solving, and basically to scale themselves and, and their teams, groups, and organizations. And you know, I'll do that through that. I've got a book, Social Wealth and How to Build Great Business Relationships. I have this card game called Cards Against Mundanity that helps build teamwork and you can use it both internally and externally. And my job is to really get the most out of people and teach them how to get the most out of everyone around them and collectively as a group. Well, thanks, Jason. And then as you can see from the from the interview, Jason has a lot of fantastic insights. So I would encourage you to go check out Jason Troy. So thank you again for today. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. I will see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you.